A few weeks ago, I was at a minister's retreat. The retreat theme was spiritual practice. And so we're given different spiritual practices to try out. The one I chose was to sit facing an empty chair and to imagine Jesus or some other prominent religious figure was sitting across from me. We were to have a conversation with this figure. So I tried this, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't imagine Jesus. But what did happen as part of the exercise was that in my mind, a whole parade of people from different parts of my life started filing past me as I looked at the chair. None of them spoke to me, but I understood what they were trying to convey. In my mind's eye, I was seeing the way in which many people in my life have, at one time or another, acted as that person who brought the sacred to me or inspired me to see the sacred in ways that I had never imagined before. In the Christian tradition, Jesus has been seen as the incarnation or the embodiment of God in human form. Jesus has been seen as a unique example of divinity enfleshed in that no other religious person has ever attained this same status. But in the latter half of the 20th century, theologians started reconceptualizing and questioning what was meant by the incarnation and even what was meant by being divine. In what way was Jesus the embodied representation of God? When I used to walk the halls of my Catholic grammar school as a child, I would see these signs in various places in the building. The signs said, God, neighbor, me. For the longest time, I couldn't figure out what these signs meant because I thought that it was a sentence and that neighbor was the verb. Eventually, I realized it was the way we were meant to love, and it came from the gospel passage that said the greatest commandment of all was to love God with your whole heart, your whole mind, and your whole soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. It was a hierarchy of love. But then years later, I heard a biblical scholar explain the passage. He said it was a single commandment, just simply the commandment to love. Because, he said, the only way that we humans could love God was by loving our neighbor and loving ourselves, because love is an embodied practice. What made Jesus God incarnate was not any supernatural power, but the power of his love and acceptance of all those on the margins, of those who stood outside of that which was acceptable. Tax collectors, independent women, the ill and the diseased. If that is the case, then Jesus is not uniquely divine, but rather a model of what it means to love outside one's comfort zone and to include a vast array of people in who is worthy of love. In the story I told this morning, the Messiah, God's messenger, was among the members of the religious community. And the reality of that became true because the way they enacted their love and graciousness and understanding was by being loving and caring and gracious to one another. 
In that sense, the Messiah was among them in each of the small acts of kindness they bestowed on one another. In asking, what if the Messiah is one of us? They became that for each other and for all those who joined their community. Becoming divinity is the act of love. And in the reading by Brazilian eco-feminist Ivana Guevara, she writes, what we call divine is within us and draws us to open passionately to other beings. And other theologians go further. What if the incarnation is revealed not only through humanity's love for humans, but in humanity's understanding that the sacred lies within all of creation? Process theologians say that the divine is a process, ever present, ever changing, ever evolving, ever learning. And it is only through the physical embodiment within plants, animals, and humanity that the divine experiences the material world. That the incarnation is the very materiality of everything in all the diversity that that implies. No one religion or worldview holds a monopoly. Process theologian Marjorie Sushaki writes, the image of God then cannot be met, modeled on an individual alone. It can only be modeled by a community that is created through irreducibly diverse members. It might be said that God could only be described as they. But Gebara also spoke of a closedness of humanity. That is for humanity to limit that which is considered sacred or precious or holy. And we see this in our world today. There is a tendency to make the divine so very small that very little falls into the category of what is sacred. And only small numbers of persons get to define and to determine who or what is considered divine or precious. And they forget. They forget how big God is, how big the sacred, how big love can be. They start to take apart God. They try and dismember God or love or whatever word works best for you. To remove those parts that don't fit into their conceptions of the sacred, the precious, the whole. As I watch the news, I see people try and usurp God and try and diminish and, and shrink and exclude others from God. I watch as women's voices are silenced or not believed or disregarded. I watch as they try and attempt to render our transgender siblings medically invisible. I watched as the African-American students at my divinity school lay down on the floor and staged a die-in during the all-school noon service because the previous evening, yet another innocent young African-American man had been shot by the police. I watch as a caravan of migrants and refugees head toward our southern border and are branded criminal and dangerous others. I watch as the truth becomes a relative thing and sometimes we cannot discern what is real or what is just a distraction. Where sometimes a meeting on religious freedom is anything but that. When I watch all these things, I am reminded of the many ways that we dismember God. We exclude, we demonize, and we marginalize. But then at other times, I am filled with hope. As many of you know, I spent much of the last week at the Parliament of the World's Religions. About 10,000 people from 80 countries representing many faith traditions, esoteric spiritual groups, and even the non-religious gather to celebrate, interact, and share the ways in which they were contributing toward peace, 
justice, and religious understanding. We were welcomed to the Parliament by the First Nations of Canada, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Mississauga, with a fire ceremony. The land on which the Toronto Convention Center sits is native land. The entire week of the Parliament featured Indigenous speakers and sessions specifically on the concerns and efforts of the Indigenous peoples of the world. We learned about Canada's program of truth, healing, and reconciliation that acknowledges the harms, in particular the harms of the Indian residential schools on Indigenous culture and traditions. We heard speakers from Africa on Yoruba traditions and a shaman from the Yanomami of the Brazilian rainforest. When voices such as these are given space, we are not dismembering, but remembering God. Re-including those who were once marginalized and excluded, exploited and sometimes killed, and making them central to the conversation. The conference also focused on other themes important on the world stage. The morning assembly on women was incredibly powerful. As women shared their stories of the work they were doing in areas as diverse as climate change, Israeli-Palestinian peacebuilding, education for women and girls in India and Afghanistan. And the speakers were interspersed with dancers and singers and spoken word and art. Again, when we focus on those at the margins, those who face sometimes staggering and dangerous challenges in order to foster peace and understanding, we are again remembering God. Climate justice was another of the major themes of the conference. We heard the voices of many from around the world, including Vandana Shiva, one of my personal sheroes, who talked about the dangers of industrial agriculture on the air and soil, and the aforementioned Brazilian shaman who was pleading for the life of the rainforest. To the Orthodox Christian representative who reminded us that one of the actions relevant to climate change was to simply stop and listen, as he said, so that you could hear the grass growing, so that you could hear the sound of a seal's heartbeat. And we heard from Christina Figueres, the architect of the Paris Accord. And when we make the priorities of air, water, soil, and well-being of the more than human world central to our conversations, we are re remembering God. It is very hard to go to something like that and not return with just a little more hope for the world, knowing that those 10,000 people at the conference are returning to their respective countries, reflecting and perhaps acting on some of the issues that were central to the conference. When I see so many people working toward and being active in so many organizations, no matter how small, that seek to make the world that much better. I believe we are remembering God. Then I come back at all these women and LGBTQ people from diverse ethnic and cultural backgrounds have won groundbreaking elections, and my hope continues. And then I land here, and so many people show up for our Diwali celebration on a cold and wet and rainy night and share with us the traditions and celebrations of a culture and tradition so different from our own. And my heart is filled. There is a saying, I'm not sure its origin, but someone said it at the parliament. They tried to bury us, but they forgot we were seeds. There are those who would try and exclude and to marginalize, to try and render others invisible, to make God so small that God could only include a very small number of people. But when they try and do that, God or life or love springs forth anyway, in a diversity of ways, through a diversity of beings. And all those in the community of God, of love, of life, cannot help but make themselves known. And when I was trying that religious exercise, 
where I was having, trying to have a conversation with Jesus, but Jesus did not show up? Some of you did. Because wherever any of us stretches beyond our comfort zone and loves those who are difficult or outside what others might consider worthy, then we have remembered God, and God is incarnate in the world through us. Amen and blessed be.